is, is not about the technical side of AI or development of models or anything like that. It's really about how um, inviting, inviting input and, and discussion around how we might use this as a tool within the research setting, particularly as staff, but also as re researchers and, and, and students and trainees, if those folks are on, on the call. Um, and I'll, although Nicole already acknowledged um, the lands on which the WHR and BCCHR sit, I wanted to extend this gratitude as well to my own place where I'm sitting, which is on um, the lands of the, the Shisalt Nation, which is also one of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, as part of uh, the, of the holidays and, and the, the work of truth and reconciliation, that's particularly prominent in September when we have the National Day. I did reread the In Plain Sight report recently, and I thought it was um, particularly relevant to the discussion we're going to have today around uh, bias and potential harm that can come from, from AI. Uh, and I encourage you all to reflect on that as I'm, as I'm speaking. Um, and so once again, we had put forward some learning objectives from this talk. And as you'll see, this isn't about uh, learning about how to build AI models or how to use how, um, how the back end technical aspects. It's really giving you a, a really high level overview of some of the terminology related to this field, as well as uh, current guidelines that have been put forward in the academic setting. And and it's an opportunity for us to ask questions and discuss how this may apply to the research institutes. And so I'm using Mentimeter for this presentation. If you're not familiar with it already, it's it's a, a, a presenting or a, a tool that allows us to ask questions and get anonymous input from the audience as we go. So you'll see that throughout the presentation, there's some embedded uh, questions for you as the audience, and um, there's no right answers to this, which is the point of this uh, initial conversation was partly to uh, gather some information on on views within the research community of how these tools might might support or um, or harm the work that we do. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you to share openly if you want to put up your hand or uh, put uh, comments in the chat as well. That's um, really encouraged, but of course, any of the information we're gathering is anonymous, so you can feel comfortable hopefully sharing, sharing, sharing your views on the topic. Uh, and before we get going, I also just wanted to um, set the stage for some of this discussion. Um, and how this might impact uh, based on our institutional values as a training institute. So WHRI in particular has a mandate for building skill for the next generation of women's health researchers and has um, defined values as committed to encouraging excellence, promoting innovation and advocating for a sustainable environment for women's health research. And those values are, the core values around that are being women-centered, are focusing on equity, diversity, and inclusivity, integrity, and accountability. And I think that this should guide our, our discussion to some degree of how we might um, leverage some of these new technologies to, to meet these values or these goals. So to start, and I apologize, I've never presented in a, a webinar before and I cannot see anyone and I cannot see the chat. So please interrupt me if you need to. Um, so, so to start, what is AI? I know this term is thrown around and used a lot right now. Um, the Canadian government has a, a directive on automated decision-making that is uh, working actively in this space to present present some common terminology and they define AI as information technology that performs tasks that would ordinarily require biological brain power to accomplish, such as making sense of spoken language, learning behaviors or sol solving problems. So overall, it's a broad field encompassing various techniques and approaches to create intelligent machines um, that perceive the environment and take action. Uh, 
more specifically some of the key concepts related to generative AI, which we'll talk a bit more about today. And I'm sure you've all heard many times. And this is a really lovely um, diagram that kind of shows how these concepts nest within each other. Uh, yeah, you'll have heard of machine learning, which is a subfield of AI that allows computers to learn and improve their performance on tasks without being explicitly programmed. And it uses algorithms that can identify patterns and make predictions uh, based on the data presented to it. Generative AI often uses machine learning. It's, it's, uh, it's an AI system that generates new data or outputs, and that could be anything from images, music, text. Uh, rather than classifying and processing existing data, it's generating new. Um, and typically generative AI uses machine learning, but that's not always the case. Uh, and then within that, you've probably heard of large language mod models, which are the basis of conversational agents like chat GPT or chat bots that are in many applications. Um, and large language models are a type of machine learning model that can process and generate natural language text. So they produce output that sounds like naturally patterned human language. Yeah. And uh, a little bit more about that. Um, because ChatGPT has been the most commonly discussed one recently, I wanted to present a bit more information about that tool specifically. But of course, there are many uh, generative AI tools that are available right now. And uh, ChatGPT is a conversational agent. Um, and the GPT stands for a generative pre-trained tra transformer. It uses machine learning, but it also uses another type of model called a deep neural network to, to create new output based on um, an existing set of data uh, that's specific to a constant context that you ask it questions to do. Uh, and so the prompts kind of define the context in which you're working. It's originally developed based on something called the common crawl data set, uh, but also pulled from many other data sources, although it's hard to get um, ex exactly specific um, uh, what what those what those data data sets are. And so it actually has a two phase modeling approach where it has the initial neural network model and then based on the prompts that it's given, it's then um, refined using another layer of machine learning. And so chat GPT is not the model or the data, it's actually the system or the user interface that allows us to use the model. Just a little bit of the, the language clarity there. Okay, so hopefully that's enough of a background. Um, and I wanted to get into some questions because as, as we, um, as I said, this, this Lunch and Learn is not just for the, for didactic learning, we really wanna learn from you as well, how, how you feel these tools are being used and, and whether or not um, they're in use uh, by staff and students, because we've heard about many applications of them already. So this is the Mentimeter part. Um, and so at the top of your screen, you'll see a, a website, it's menti.com. And if you go to that and you enter the code that's shown there, you can answer the questions. So I'll give you all a minute to log in and, and start to do that. And as you answer, uh, we'll see the bars pop up. And remember, there's no right or wrong answers here. Oh no, that is not good. Let me just stop sharing for a second and see what's going on. Love, love technology. <laughs> You know, in the question, there was a question there about how does the learning healthcare system fit into the scheme? I am going to be talking a teensy bit about that when it gets to my bit, but let's keep thinking about that in the back of our minds. And then when we have more Q&A, we can talk mm -hmm. about it. 
Yeah, if folks are okay, we can save. I, I, I see this question and maybe we can save it for, um, for the end, for questions to the end. Sorry. Now. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure why this isn't working. It should. There, I just reissued the code. So let's try this again. Apologies, everyone, for that. No worries, Beth. In my mind, it's like those lottery balls are just coming down the pipeline and issuing you a new code. That's the <laughs> visual I have in my brain right now. Is it the same code or will we get a different one? No, it'll be a new code. So let's uh, let's try this again. Okay, someone try the code that's now at the top of the screen and see if it works for you. Yay, we're in. Thank you. Also, just because I'm an ethicist here, please don't think I'm trying to get information to, to tell on you or something like that. Are you doing it? Did you do this? Did you do that? I'm not, that's not the point of this. I know that's already been said, but sometimes like, if you don't know me, I guess I'm an ethicist, but I'm not the ethics police or the FIPA police or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, and as we'll talk about later, the, the guidance, none of the guidance explicitly prohibits this that are out there right now. It's just more, this is more of an opportunity to share so that we can inform any future guidance around real community needs and wants. So it does look like there's a few that have used these tools, but the majority are still saying no. Does anyone want to volunteer in the chat if there's anything that has stopped you from using them, any con concerns or um, that is something we didn't, ex I didn't explicitly ask about, but I'm, I'm curious um, a little bit about the why, why people are choosing not to use these tools still. But I'll move on. I think well, we have a few more coming in. Want me to read out from the chat, Beth? We do have some comments. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have um, time to figure out how it works and why why I would use it. Um, it is an it depends question. I have used it to teach in a course at UBC as part of an assignment, um, but not part of work um, explicitly though tools like Zoom transcriptions and Grammarly might count. So that is kind of yes. Yeah. Yeah. Privacy concerns. Um, do, 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 do. As you is, yeah, no, go ahead. I'm going to go to the next question. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, keep keep going. Um, um, yeah, Shelly has a question about um, is using AI uh, to write emails also unethical? Um, I think that's yeah we're, we're we're here today to have these conversations. Yeah. So yeah, as we kind of assumed, the most common tool that people have been used, and this is in general, not just in your work, but if uh, I, we're curious about the experience of the community with these various tools. Um, and again, if you've answered other and you feel willing to share, um, please, please put it in the chat. But I know I myself have played around with chat GPT just for fun, but I haven't actually used many of these other tools. We'll give this one another, another minute. 
And for my own novice brain, I mean, I'm thinking of things like when I create an event, bright event, and there's a little button that says, would you like me to automatically create a nice little blurb for you for this event? Or, you know, when I'm typing a Gmail thing and it says, would you like to say these words after? Is that all in the scope of what we're talking about with generative AI? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those platforms now have embedded open AI or chat GPT based tools. Um, but some of them are using other other companies' technology. It just depends on the platform. So there's a lot of those now embedded help. And it looks like, yeah, so Bing integrates chat GPT when using the Edge browser. And Manish is saying chat GPT data is 2021, so not current, which is true. Um, although that will be updated as new releases come and the paid version is a little bit more up to date. And we'll get we'll get to the UBC rules. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next one if everyone is ready. So now to get this is an open text if if there's specific tasks, um, like Nicole said in writing an event bright blurb or some anything like that that you want to share that you've been using it for. Uh, this is an opportunity to do that. And I recognize that only a few of you indicated that you've used it for work specifically. But... I know someone who made their wonderful uh, PHSA performance link goals using chat GPT. So there's another interesting way to do it. So it looks like there's a, a, a variety of, of applications that people have done through communication and editing and also drafting content for, for letters and summarizing information, but also for coding, which is one of the in, initial use, uses of, I think, GitHub. Summarizing literature, drafting summaries. So a lot of summarizing. We'll give this just a couple more seconds and we'll move on. I, I, I appreciate that we're getting copy editing. That's really helpful to hear the Okay, so one more question before we get into a little bit more information. Um, not thinking about what you've actually done, but what do you view will be the most valuable use of this if for your work? What is the value add in your opinion of, of tools using generative AI? Again, what most people are doing, which is editing and summar summarizing, but so for those that put efficiency, can you be more specific? What what format or what what ways does this increase in efficiency? So we see some some things around wordsmithing. Um, brainstorming, summarizing text, simplifying boring tasks, quickly getting an answer. I think Nicole and I went to a talk a little while ago um, where they were, they were talking about using generative AI as a, as a research assistant. So doing a first line 
literature review or or summary of results from a literature review that um, that can then speed up the time for writing final documents. So writing code, but it's all about efficiency. All of these things relate to trying to save time as we're all very um, busy in our different roles, clearing communication, Great. Okay, so now what are the current guidelines saying? And and just to be um, clear up front, none of the guidelines that I reviewed, and um, I've only pulled a couple of them together for this talk, but I looked at a variety of institutes across um, Canada. None of them explicitly prohibit the use, but all have some urging of caution. Um, most relevant to us probably as UBC and SFU. And these are not um, specifically for staff use, but these are around academic use of, of generative AI. And so UBC and SFU both take a, a fairly similar approach where use uh, for academic purposes, purposes is up to the course instructor. Um, and, and it doesn't, it automatically equate to mis misconduct to use generative AI to help with assignments or, or teaching. Um, but it needs to be very, the use of that needs to be explicitly allowed by the course instructor in both cases. Uh, and, and guidelines around that is provided on a course by course basis. Does anyone, I know we have some instructors on, on this. So if you have additional information of, of, of how you've used it and how you applied these guidelines, please put it in the chat. Okay, and Matthias, thank you for sharing some, some useful guidelines. The other guidelines I wanted to highlight here are just uh, recent guidance that's come out from the government of Canada. I wanted to share this just because this is specifically looking at staff at um, public service and how um, the government of Canada is approaching the use of, of uh, AI to support administrative work. Uh, and so again, there's there's, you, you can take a moment to read this, but there isn't a blanket prohibition, but there is um, really clear restrictions and uh, around using generative AI for anything that could in, involve a high impact decision that might impact, impact people's rights or privileges under law. So this is um, using, using these tools to summarize information for say, uh, uh, decisions around immigration uh, applications or anything like that that could uh, infringe people's rights and privileges. And if you think of that in the context of the research, uh, again, anything that could downstream impact things like care decisions or the way uh, research results or, or products are used or applied that would make them inequitable or uh, impact um, people's access to, to health system resources would be explicitly not allowed in this case. But one of the things that I found really useful in all this documentation um, was the guidance around responsible use of generative AI tools and this concept of the faster principles that are being presented. And that is um, ensuring fairness, accountability, security, transparency, uh, being educated and making sure that the use of um, the AI tool, it supports organizational needs and, and supports improvement to outcomes for Canadians. And so you could apply all of these concepts to the health care system and health research space. And I'll just give you 
a, a minute to read that. And now I'm going to turn things over to Holly. We'll talk about at the PHSA site what's happening. Yeah, well, there's tons of artificial intelligence research going on at the PHSA. And so um, a number of my colleagues that do support work, service work, like I do at BCH in Providence, decided a couple of years ago to do a pretty extensive literature review to help inform our work so that we could better support the research community. And there's a link to it there if you wanted to review it. It gives some of the uh, things to think about when you're using artificial intelligence. But I have to say... <laughs> The thing that I am the most concerned about is I'm very concerned about artificial intelligence because I think it exacerbates the problems that we already have and the inequities that we already have. One specifically is around data access. We don't have some very basic things in place to do certain kinds of research now and artificial intelligence is just going to really um, increase that divide. I know uh, I did a, a survey of the research community in PHSA, which I serve. Um, in, I guess, last fall to try to see, you know, what I should be working on in the next year. And the single <laughs> the biggest theme to come up with is access to data. We need access to data to be able to do research. And this is where it relates to the learning healthcare system uh, question that uh, emerged at the beginning of our, of our discussion. Um, if you, I see so many researchers struggling to get access to data that they are over relying on consent when it's not appropriate, for example. Um, and what that does is that, of course, if you just have consented data, um, then you're only including people in your study that already benefit from the system and trust the system. You get this thin slice of the world, everybody that looks like me and everyone else is left out. If you're only doing artificial intelligence with consented studies, you're exacerbating uh, those gaps. We have to find a way to have near real-time access to data for research, to do learning healthcare system research, something that I'm very interested in as an ethicist is pragmatic real-time clinical trials and also cluster randomized, randomized clinical trials. So we're doing a project right now that's led by Anita Ho, who's an incredible ethics professor, about how can we support cluster trials within our healthcare system. And what that means is you might have a site in Ontario and a site, maybe children's is a site here or women's is a site here, and everybody's assigned to something here, assigned to an RMB there. there it's a really great uh, opportunity to use our artificial intelligence, for example. Of course, it's all unconsented because you're using entire populations for very quick um, uh, real world studies. Uh, how do we cope with that? We can't even really cope with hypothesis generated research right now. We can't really cope with learning healthcare system research right now. We can't get access for data. So I'm very worried that the literature and science is way ahead of us and about things that we're not actually gonna be able to operationalize within our health authorities. And I think the only way to solve this is for uh, us to have a real community of practice approach, a real community approach to um, put pressure where it's appropriate and also to help educate each other about how we're gonna be able to use these tools appropriately. I am just very, very worried. I know you guys are gonna go forward with artificial intelligence and I know it's happening all over the place and I support some of these big projects that are using it, but I know many of them are using consented data. And FYI, if you think that you're gonna get around data access with consent, you're not. Because there's certain pots of data within BC and elsewhere that even with consent, you're still not getting access to the data. So you're having this huge trade-off that you don't really wanna do. You really wanna look at full populations with a waiver. Um, and then you're not even getting the data that you want anyway. So we have, to, as a community, we have to come to terms with this. We have to come to terms with if you're going to do real learning healthcare system research that embraces AI, that embraces places, cluster trials and adaptive design and all these things, we're going to have to kind of do everything differently and rethink data. And the first step is to stop thinking about research as secondary use of data. It's a primary use of data. And that's actually in our mandate at PHSA. So we need to change our language and everything. But that's kind of what I <laughs> wanted to say here. And we can talk more about ethics when the questions come up. But um, yeah. I think we all need to think very differently about it. Yeah. And that's, um, that's there's a lot of good points there around um, the the building of AI models and, and how we apply this. Uh, as academics and to the healthcare system. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some questions about that later. The thing, having consented data is an issue, but even some of the administrative data sets are not representative 
of the whole population. So I think there's concerns across the board. And it, one of the um, important considerations that you highlight in this document is just considering what biases are inherent in your data set, regardless of where it comes from. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But um, specifically to generative AI, which was the focus of, of this, um, there are many risks that have been brought up around the use of, of these tools. And I'll give a few examples of these afterwards, but um, some of those risks related to demonstrated issues with accuracy of the output of these models, partly based on what Holly was talking about with um, the models are, are um, exacerbating biases and, and misinformation based on the data sets that are used to develop them. Um, they are also a, there's also a concern from the academic integrity perspective that most of these models don't appropriately cite source information. So there's a concern around in, infringement on IP rights if you're using these tools within the research context. Um, there's some privacy and security uh, concerns, again, are, are, are related to the data input and use, and particularly um, if you're inputting your own data to be summarized in one of these tools, it's important to consider where that data is going and if you have approval to do that, because um, the, the data sharing um, agreements for those companies and, and, and tools are not always particularly clear. Uh, just to throw in there a bit more jargon, if you hear this, um, I find this term a little bit funny, but uh, one of the things that is in reading through uh, reviews of chat GPT in particular, there's often talk of something called hallucinations, which is the phenomena that these generative AI technologies produce content that appears credible and, and reasonable. But if you go back to verifying that output, you can find that it's actually an inaccurate representation of the source data and is inappropriately mm -hmm. cited and, and is nonsensical. So it's something to be aware of and uh, concerned with. So just a couple examples, I, I did a small literature review on, on uh, groups that had evaluated the use of ChatGPT for, as a research tool. Um, and there's lots of other examples of, of, like this, but two that stuck out for me that highlight some of these risks are um, this one paper by McGowan, uh, where they looked at ChatGPT and BARD, and they um, prompted it to retrieve citations related to a specific topic in psychology. And when they reviewed those citations, they found that ChatGPT had 6% accuracy, while BARD actually had 0% accuracy. Uh, most of the citations listed were not actually true papers, um, or they had mixed, uh, merged several papers into a variety of, of citations, uh, but they sounded plausible. So this is where the hallucination concept comes from. In another paper, uh, the authors provided a set of abstracts um, uh, from a literature review and asked um, ChatGPT to write a summary of content. And there not only was um, the problem wasn't the hallucination aspect, but uh, when they reviewed and verified the output, there was actually a lot of concerns with plagiarism because it was just um, taking whole chunks of the papers uh, and putting it into the, the summary without citing it properly. So again, something to be aware of if you're using these tools. Um, finally, this is a really great article from BMJ Global Health that talks a little bit more about the theoretical risks of, of AI. Um, and I'm sure you most of you saw when there was all that, the CEOs of these companies that are developing these tools calling for regulation of the industry. And a lot of that is based on these, um, the bottom part, the, the existential threat uh, around um, the AI has the ability to use tools that are not strictly limited and it could become self-replicating and self-improving. And if it, 
we continue to advance uh, the complexity and the capability of these AI tools without putting in limits or a conscience, uh, so to speak, of around what it's doing, we theoretically have the capacity for machines to start thinking faster and acting faster and controlling each other. And so you get into that whole kind of existential threat of artificial intelligence, but more proximate to what it's happening in reality now is is the threat around um, misinformation and and using these tools for for harm that that is highlighted in the above boxes. And like Holly said, this uh, reentrenchment of social inequities and inequities in health. So that all sounds terrible, but um, the reality is there is, uh, there is still, this is, this is a field that's moving forward, as Holly said. And, and when we put all these guidelines together, there's kind of a core set of activities that are recommended across them all uh, around how to safely um, apply these technologies to your work that I just wanted to highlight here. The first is really consulting and considering if it's really if it's actually even necessary. Do you need to use uh, Chat GPT for whatever task you're doing? Uh, and also consulting with your manager or people like Holly to make sure that you have approval and what you're planning to do is an appropriate use of the technology. Then, of course, as we've talked about, because of the concerns with accuracy of output and and IP, um, always uh, need to first review um, your data sources and consider what possible biases might be uh, uh, inherent in the output. Um, learn about prompting and pilot test and refine your prompting to make sure you're actually generating reliable output. And then of course, review that output carefully to make sure it meets standards of ethics and scholarly conduct. And then finally, the other important concept to consider is um, most of these guidelines talk about the importance of disclosing use. So if you're using uh, generative AI to create content, it's really important that you make clear that that is what you've done. There are now guidelines of how to cite that use through the APA and the MLA that you can look up um, so that people can then um, read your work with that context in mind. Okay. Back to questions. Um, given a bunch of background information about some of the current academic guidelines and um, uh, federal guidelines, but I'm curious, do you think that these academic guidelines, such as the ones at UBC and SFU, are appropriate for all use at the Research Institute, or do you think that we need to have a separate governance structure for how we're doing our work? Well, that seems like there's many, many are looking for clear guidance for staff that is separate from the academic use. Right, we'll move on to the next one. Um, as we develop guidance and provide resources, wanted to know, are there any specific training or learning opportunities that you'd like to see related to AI? And this could be around the development of, of algorithms and, and, and also the application and use. So what is it that you need to become more sure or, or, or more confident when and when not to uh, engage with this kind of technology? Okay. 
some guidance on which platforms are appropriate for different uses. And again, use cases of what would be considered appropriate. Organizational subscriptions. One of the things I noticed um, on the UBC website that is is uh, some training around AI prompts. So yeah, how to how to properly prompt because that has a real impact on how the output is developed. So that's something I was interested in learning more about because it's actually a skill. Guidance for trainees. I think yes. there's a real role for AI to do a lot of compliance work. Frankly, I know this isn't this is more like how what I would want to do with it. I think that there because compliance is what it is. It's the skeleton of permissibility that we have to work within. I think it it could be very well served and eliminate a ton of bureaucracy by using AI. I would love to personally look at that. Yeah. All right. That's really helpful. Thank you. If you have, if you want to um, clarify or add to what you've put here, feel free to again put it in the chat. And then I just have one more question, and then we'll kind of open it up more broadly. Um, do you have any remaining questions for Research Institute leadership related to use of AI at work? Because this is an active conversation um, with with Institute leadership and we're looking for some guidance from the community of where to focus that discussion and, and take it forward. And some of this, I obviously we can take from the previous question, but there's anything else. So just whether or not it's allowed, how it's allowed. And this is a question a bit for you, Holly, around um, appropriate data sharing with these tools. And see someone's hoping that the use isn't explicitly prohibited, which is good to know. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I, I was hoping that we would be able to let other people speak, but in this format, we are a bit restricted to the Q&A and, and chat feature. So Nicole, how do you wanna? I've, I've asked some folks to put um, their questions in the Q&A, um, in the Q&A spot. And so um, I think there's five in there right now. Um, I don't know if you and Holly wanna start by by answering those and folks can um, follow up um, in the chat if there's we can kind of have a an engaging discussion via typing and I'll try to moderate okay I think the first couple Holly you already answered did the did I just did I answer the over relying on consent when it's not appropriate one I think so. It's it's just what I see researchers doing is they they think oh maybe this will do something maybe maybe I'm gonna get access to data if I get consent even though I know it's not appropriate for my study. I really want to look at a whole population, um, and so you do that and you really should be getting a consent waiver to look at the entire population, and so you're limiting it to this very thin slice of uh, participants and an underrepresentative. Uh, we know that lots of empirical research that says that uh, only certain people, mostly certain people, participate in research. That's what I meant. Yeah, I like 
elation, which I find really hard to say, but that's a better term than hallucination. And yeah, I, I wrote a, read another article that was criticizing the term hallucination as it's not very, it doesn't actually encompass what's happening, which that's a great word. Um, so for many, they, they asked uh, any way for hallucinations to be flagged when it happens. I don't personally know of any system that's already been developed to validate output. I think that's pretty person dependent, but if anyone else knows of something being developed in that space, that would be really helpful and um, to well, ensure. That's there's some really interesting research going on at BC Cancer uh, with artificial intelligence and looking at screening and stuff like that. And what can we do, you know, using that as opposed to the way you would traditionally do it, comparing them? Is it this? It just needs to be the same. It doesn't need to be better. If it's just the same, you're saving mountains of resources and time and you're uh, eliminating wait times and stuff like that. And I think this is where research wants to be. Like AI wants to be in research right now to compare and contrast. There's also BC Cancer seems to be doing a lot of interesting work in this space because that the last digital health talk that we had where they're using NLP to just pull information from unstructured notes in charts so that they can understand patient priorities based on what people are talking about just in those unstructured data sets is that's a really cool application. Um, but again, it, there are some concerns there with they're looking at um, online chat groups and the people that are using those chat groups are not necessarily all the people that could benefit from resources. So it, there's always that flip side of the coin of being aware of, of the limitations of what you're doing. Um, again, Holly, I think this is more for you because I'm not aware of this, but is this on Health Canada's ra radar for regulating use of generative AI in clinical research. I didn't find anything related to that. Um, no, I mean, I think people are hesitant to, uh, I mean, any if you go to any kind of like research ethics, compliancy type workshops, conferences, everybody's talking about, everybody's doing workshops on it. I think it would be a huge mistake to really, I know the privacy commissioners and everything are like that are, are trying to put out guidances and stuff about it. It would be a mistake to regulate this before we even know what's going on because you don't want to squash innovation when you're at the kind of this stage. And I think they're certainly aware of that. But I think that um, it's probably going to come. And if you have something to say about it, I would get on it and publish it and try to, <laughs> try to make sure that it's informed. Uh, um, cause certainly it's going on at really high level. Like some of these big multi, multi, multi million dollar, huge projects like Marathon of Hope and stuff like that, they're using artificial intelligence. So it's on everybody's radar. Everyone knows. Yeah. And I did hear, um, inklings that there will be PHSA staff guidance around generative AI for staff use, um, in the future, but they're still going through this process of like what we're, we're doing here. I don't know if you have other information about that, but of course, many of us are PHSA staff. So when that happens, it'll be important to ensure that the we're not um, in conflict with that. And you know, when I talk to security experts and stuff like that about artificial intelligence and whatnot, they always say like, don't forget that we're not you know, you're still, it's a tool, like it's, it's, yes, is it the Terminator? Maybe, I don't know, like, it's, maybe is it the scary thing, but it's, it's a tool that we want our, to make available to our experts to use when appropriate. And you guys have to help develop the guidance, co-develop the guidance around when is it appropriate? It would be a disaster if you have somebody like me coming up with it. Mm -hmm. I'm an ethicist. I am not using it. You are using it. So I think that this is a really great example of community practice where we have to come up together as a community, what is reasonable, and then look at it over time to think, do things need to be, need to be tweaked or whatnot? Yeah. Don't be scared to, to tell people you're using it because you, you, you're the cutting edge. You need to tell people what's appropriate. It can't be the other way around. So how is the Institute going to deal with the challenge of limited content about some regions or subject matters that currently stand up? as a limitation or criticism of using AI? That's a really good question. And um, I don't think any of us are at the level of the Institute to, to answer that, but it is, it is something 
as you're, if you're working in this space, just again, to be aware of what those limitations are. Um, we're actively trying to, like Holly said, advocate for better access to not just consented data, but establishing this concept of the learning health system so that we can address some of those um, data access issues that might currently limit our work, but. And the community needs to include like everybody in Canada and yeah. internationally in some, with some things with rare diseases. So we can't just be reliant if our data is imperfect from the, the samples that we can pull from in here, we need to go bigger, much, much bigger. It has to be a lot easier to do um, studies at the national and international level. It doesn't solve all the problems, but obviously. So Manish also said that he was at another conference where, yeah, there's tons of discussion about this everywhere. Um, for any of you who want to participate in the BC Digital Health Forum, which is Digital Health Week in November, there'll be a panel discussion about AI and the BC Health System as well that we've been planning. Um, and so suggesting that there's an expert group at BCCHR, WHRI, um, formed to keep the community up to date, which I think is a really fantastic idea that we can bring to, to the, the leadership. And then finally, David says, considering the potential threats, um, such as the envisaged singularity when technology overtakes human intelligence, how prepared is the Institute to deal with potential threats, disasters such as hacking, violation of privacy and other technologically related challenges? That's also a great question. And I think that's something that, um, that needs to be addressed by leadership and also some of our informatics teams and, and security folks that are helping set up these systems. But you need, we need basic building blocks in place to be able to do anything advanced like this. How are we going to, like, we don't want to be behind the curve. We need your basic things. You need access to data. You need like the things that come up in the survey for me, it was like things that have been around forever. We have got to solve that. We've got to solve how to do a hypothesis generated research. We've got to cope better with waivers of consent, all of that stuff. Then we can maybe get ready for some of these, the tsunami of uh, tricky questions that's coming. Cause I agree, I think it is coming. And I think you should have a group of experts that's ready on the fly to start uh, advising corporate and, and the institutes about these things. And that is um, a perfect segue to close this off and talk about what's coming next. Um, <laughs> so this is this is an active conversation within the research institutes and um, we'll be taking this information um, to our leadership to help advise, like inform them of what everyone thinks around what's needed at the research institute. Um, I love the idea of that expert panel. Um, so definitely we'll follow up with folks about that. Um, and then hopefully this won't be the end of the conversation, that this will be an ongoing, active, engaged um, conversation amongst research institute staff and investigators, as well as leadership, because it is it is important that we stay on top of this and and allow uh, um, us as, as institutes to not, um, be so behind the curve as, as Manish has highlighted there, um, and be prepared to do this safely and effectively. Yeah. Can I say one other thing just before we wrap up? Yeah. Remember that when we're not talking about law, law is a very difficult thing to change, but when, and in law is very high level usually, when we're talking about policies and guidances, it means it's ink on paper. It's somebody like me sat at a computer and wrote it and put it out. It is always subject to change. If it does not work for you, you know, you have to speak up. If, it, if it's make, it's forcing you to do something you think is wrong or bad for your patients or is unwise, you need to speak up. I see so often that the research community is just like, oh, another stupid guy that doesn't work for me. I hate this policy. No. You can't do that. You have got to speak up and you've got to like, you know, rattle the cage a little bit because it, it's just ink on paper. Anything can be changed. Law is hard. The other things are not. So don't just, you know, don't, don't just go along with stuff if it doesn't, if it truly doesn't work for you, especially in an area like this, no one knows what they're doing. Everyone's just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Well said. Thanks, Holly. 
Um, thank you everyone for participating um, and feel